Hi, I'm going to share with you uh, my take on this notion of teach less, learn more. To start off with, the, the preamble for teach less, learn more, that is that this storm of change that is coming our way. You will hear a lot of conversation centered around this idea of internet or industrial revolution 4.0, you will hear things about how artificial intelligence is just going to engulf human creation, human creativity, and our future of employment. You will hear a lot of scary stories about how countries like Finland and Norway and, and Scandinavian countries particularly are working on this thing called the living wages because they can easily anticipate up to 30% of their population being unemployed. So the leaders of the university have decided to go in a particular direction. And the tagline of this direction is teach less, learn more. But they are much more than just a tagline. Tag now, we can look at this problem from two different perspectives. And they are actually diverging perspectives. To start out with, many people talk about off change. Let's teach off change. Now, the way I look at it is, if you're going to talk about teaching of change, it's about teaching the item that changes itself. So for example, you're saying that historically we used to do something like this, and now we are planning to do something else. Last time there was um, Industrial Revolution 1.0, then subsequently became 2.0, and 3.0, and so on and so forth. If you take this uh, trajectory of this kind of thinking, you'll be always lagging the change, because you can't teach until change takes place. Now, teaching for change has a different perspective. It talks about change, not from a general perspective, but from a chronological and genealogical perspective. That means you try to anticipate change by looking at, the, looking at change itself. So that way, you anticipate change as it happens. Now, this is not easy, because you need to have a big net, what some people call the word meta-narrative. You have this big picture of how things happen. But that will certainly help our students to know that how the change will look like. So there are a lot of indicators that currently uh, many scholars will share with you about the development of personal competencies that are perennial. This demand for a very competent graduate always is, uh, surpasses the need of very informed graduate. So there are certain things that Teach Less, Learn More is trying to leverage on, is to create this perennially ever fresh, or evergreen graduate. Now, the, the, as a teacher, we have certain kind of responsibility. And one of our major responsibility is at the end of the day, if our students don't learn to learn, we have failed to teach. Because gone are the days where informing students and getting them to pass exams was our major role. We need to create this learning person, this person who constantly strive and evolve as the situation around him evolves. So learning for life becomes the core central issue, or lifelong learning, the way our GTGC writes, becomes the core purpose of coming to the university, as opposed to Googling and staying at home. So this is, so we have finished with the preamble. So now let's talk about the teach less, learn more, teaching for quality learning itself. So there are several key uh, issues that we will have to talk about. Predominantly or primarily, the three pillars or in our Taylor's framework talks about three dimensions of core purpose. The core purpose here is academic excellence, life skill, and emotional well-being. So together you put all this, becomes our Taylor's framework and the teach less, learn more that, that will bring this alive. Okay, So this is a, a general description of our framework. So as I said, it, the, the three core purpose came from this. This so The first thing I hear about teach less, learn more is people come and say, look, if this doesn't add up, how can I teach less and expect the students to learn more? This equation doesn't add up. It's true. If you're looking at it from a quantitative perspective, I teach so many hours, you learn so many hours, because people tend to harmonize there's a link between the number of hours I teach and number of hours you learn. But the idea is to go beyond this. So one thing I'd like to draw some, your, your attention to this mathematical equation. 
3 plus 4 is 7, right? And in, in any space and time, 3 plus 4 equals to 7. But if you reverse the equation the other way, 7 is not necessarily 3 plus 4. There are more ways to derive 7 than adding 3 and 4. The reason why I'm bringing this up is this common notion that I teach you learn is flawed. Now, the reverse of learning is teaching. You have learned, therefore I have taught. But just because I think I have taught you doesn't mean you have learned. So that's the reason why I'm trying to draw your attention to this equation that teaching doesn't presuppose that learning. Learning presupposes teaching. So the reverse, so this is another point to illustrate the same fact. The reverse of learning is teaching, but the reverse of teaching is not learning. I know you have done a lot of work on am I, am sorry, the whole works, right? All of us had sleepless nights staying up and getting this on our tight deadline. Now, all that work you have done is the quantitative part. That's calculating the, the student learning time, that's calculating mapping against the teaching, uh, teaching and learning, the TGCs to the learning outcomes, to the program objectives, and so on and so forth. But this project of Teach Less, Learn More goes beyond the quantitative aspect. It also talks about the qualitative aspect. And the qualitative aspect is this. Generally, you see from a, from a teacher-centric perspective. I'm using the word teacher-centric it means from the teacher's perspective of things. Is learning centered around you delivering a lesson. So that's where a lot of people have this issue. Look, I teach, therefore you are learning. And I need you to reverse that order because from a learner's perspective, life is not so straightforward. He picks up messages from all kind of direction. He's watching videos. He picks up messages from talking to his friends. He talks about things that he already have, and he matches with what he knows and with what you are saying. So from a learner's perspective, information flows from multi-direction, multi-dimensional. So the whole idea of teach less and more is to orchestrate the learning experience rather than transmitting content. So the center of teach less, learn more is about quality learning. The academic's role here is to orchestrate the learning, the learner's learning experience, contrary to the conventional model of transmitting content. This initiative calls for Taylor's academics to teach for learning, to engage our students, and to prepare them for life in terms of social and emotional competency. This is the core of quality learning. It's about transforming and enabling the learners as opposed to just informing the learner. So this is where the true paradigm of Teach Less, Learn More comes in. It's not about contact hours. It's about orchestrating the learner's learning experience. Now, to go beyond teaching content, experience, feedback, and reflection, we will talk about the common issues that we have when we are in the midst of the early stages of implementing Teach Less, Learn More. The first thing I need you is to come away from this contact for credit mindset. Because the conventional model is to actually look at teaching and learning as four credit has so many hours of contact hours, or eight credit module has so many contact hours. And that seemed to be the biggest challenge that many of us are facing, because partly because we are stuck in this mindset. Now, from a bigger picture point of view, we really don't know how learning takes place. If, if every one of us are so vivid, have a vivid uh, understanding of how learning takes place, we wouldn't have this di variance in the, how people learn. The reason is there is still a, a, a certain degree of uh, guessing. So, but what we know is we have information flow, and then we have wisdom. Wisdom, in my interpretation at least, is, is manifesting of information in a very purposeful, strategic way. So now everything else falls in this box of learning, and we need to understand how learning takes place. So I've, I'm synthesizing a whole degree of literature on learning. So I have come up with my four new 4A model of learning. You have the first A, which is acquire. So how people acquire information. So information is there. People can acquire. And there are many ways to acquire. They can listen to you lecture. They can watch a video. They can read text. They can have uh, a whole bunch of information coming to them where it's just a very rudimentary approach of acquiring information. Then what happens is, through dialogue, conversation, and construction with colleagues and other people, people tend to align this, this information. 
because information comes to you in different different directions. We need to change it and all face in in a, in, in a particular direction. So an alignment. This is where tutorials and things like that become very powerful. In the midst of discussion, you get to orchestrate, you get to harmonize the thinking. Then you got to accommodate, the, and this is where people misunderstand. Because once you get a piece of jigsaw puzzle, you got to make sure that jigsaw puzzle fits into the other pictures that you have within your mind. Because you have acquired information in the past, and to, you have to make sure that new information sits in very well with the rest of the inf schemata that you have acquired over your lifetime. So this is where an academic's role really comes in. Through lots of heavy discussion, and, and, and either digitally or virtually, he helps the students to align and accommodate new ideas into his existing ones. And then he gives them opportunity to actualize this idea. So this is where assessment and all this comes in. So, so teach less, learn more, tend to focus on the alignment and accommodation rather than the acquisition. Because uh, historically, if you follow blindly the t traditional teaching and learning protocol, of course, I'm very sure it varies from lecturer to lecturer. They tend to deliver content as the major part of their, their protocol of work. So this is where Teach Less, Learn More is saying, no, we need you to shift to alignment and accommodation because there are other ways to, to, to mobilize the acquisition stage. So video, lecture, reading, book, uh, act, uh, direct experience, and things like that. But when you meet the students, please spend more time talking and organizing their thought rather than filling in uh, with information. So there are four ways to do this. You have four levers to transform teaching and learning. So as Archimedes said, if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, I shall move the world. So these are the four levers you have. You have the ability to select content. So here I use the word purposeful content selection. Because out of fear, we may end up teaching, uh, delivering a, a broad body of knowledge, which may not be supportive of depth learning in-depth learning. Then you have instructional design, because you have a choice of how people acquire this knowledge. Is it passive reading, passive watching videos, or actively engaging, or partly passive, partly engaging? So you have this idea, you have, this, you have control about how students engage this content. Then you have technology. Now, technology is a great magnifier. It magnifies your effort, 10 folds, 20 folds, just like this video I'm making in front of you. I'm doing this on, on a particular day and a time. You'll be watching it on your own. You may watch it again, or you, most importantly, you may choose not to watch it, right? So technology has this ability to magnify your efforts to multifolds. Then you have assessment, because assessment also becomes a tool for not only measuring learning, but to promote good learning. So first thing is this, this notion of um, this notion of content selection, a purposeful content selection. So generally, you will hear people argue from a perspective of broad-based curriculum. I learn a little bit of many things. Then some people say, no, we are a professional body. We need to have deep-based or depth curriculum in, the, in, in a very deep manner. And then there are pragmatists who say, oh, I'll follow a triangular approach. So the idea is not whether it's deep, broad, or triangular, or whatever in between. It's to see the, the fit. Now, there are knowledge that we need to know so that we can function in society in a meaningful way. Um, so there are things I need to know about poetry. There are things that I need to know about psychology. There are things I need to know from a quantitative perspective, from the science and the physics. There are things I need to know from economics. So that's the broad base. But then there's selected discipline that I need to know in depth, not only so that I, could, uh, I know what an engineer needs to know, but I have, the knowledge has affected the way I think and see the world. I can see the world from a very professional lens rather than a generic lens. So this is where you as an academic or as a program, uh, as a collection of academics in a program, to orchestrate body of knowledge in a purposeful way so that it makes sense from a general living skills point of view and, and the depth of a profession or professional. The other thing we tend to talk about is uh, this idea of face-to-face -face because the biggest part that many academics felt that they had to sacrifice in this whole teaching and learning undertaking is, sorry, this te uh, teach less, learn more undertaking is the reduction of contact hours. 
So historically, we tend to look at the, the higher picture, right? Where the lectures and tutorial tend to dominate the narrative of your US as a professional. So you call yourself a lecturer where you spend 80% of your job lecturing. So suddenly someone comes and tells you, stop doing that. Obviously it's disturbing, it disturbs me too. So it disturbs all of us because we are defined by what we do and how we do it. And we tend to do two other things. We have this thing called assessment and we have this thing called e-learning. Um, and we tend to keep them as scaffolding to just hold up what we do. So we tend to give assessment to measure how well our students have learned what we have taught. Then we have this e-learning component that we tend to use it more for administrative tasks. I'm not, I'm, I, obviously I'm over generalizing here, but just stick with me. So you have this e-learning component where you kind of post things for students to extract and people kind of post things for you to extract. So it becomes like a glorified mailbox. Now the idea is to, since we agree from the beginning, learners learn differently in, in a multi-dimensional perspective. The question is how do you integrate, align this multi-dimensional education? Rather than saying that I'll meet you all the time, I will meet you selected times to, to have a conversation on this. But as far as knowledge acquisition is concerned, these are the few uh, e-learning videos or activities you can do to acquire knowledge. Now there are things that you need to do in assessment that will promote certain kind of learning certain kind of research, certain kind of collaborative and, 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 and uh, making of new meanings of new ideas. Now, the other thing uh, that the conversation also tends to around teach less, learn more is the notion of instructional videos. Now, the reason why people talk about instructional video that's, is not the magic penicillin that we are looking for. It's just a low-lying fruit. It's simple. I'm used to talking to class. Now I talk to the same class through a medium. So that's why, uh, because it, it kind of falls into our narrative of being a lecturer. So the in sort of lecture, so this instructional video becomes uh, a substitute for conventional lecture. And then also there are people who are beginning to think and ask questions like, why would anybody want to watch these videos? Can I be replaced uh, by a video? So the question is, it depends on how you view the videos. If you look at your video as a knowledge transfer station, you know, it's something that I'm going to read the book, paraphrase the book in a video, and therefore this video is out there. You may fail this in this uh, experience, partly because no matter what topic you're going to talk about, as long as within the curriculum, there are far better looking people, much cleverer than you, and a far more attractive video that's out there in YouTube. So you are just competing against the giants, which you can't. But if you make your video very content dependent, program dependent, context specific, in the form of inquiring, uh, process, inspirational, if you make your videos in different perspective where it, it adds to the learning experience, then your video become an instrumental part of the learner's learning experience. So you have to decide how do you want to uh, theme your video rather than a set of PowerPoints and rereading the PowerPoints. So one of the criticism I have about this video is I don't have much text and my text and my speech are not aligned. I believe that you have text to inspire you and you have my voice to give you context. So collectively the learning experience is better than if I was to type out bullet points and reread the bullet points to you. Now assessment as I told you is the last one I put in my list. Because it's really, really, really powerful. I mean, most of you all who have a PhD, you know that you actually started off with a question and you spent three years trying to answer it. In the process of trying to answer that question, you learn a whole bunch and it defined who you are. So assessment, you need to design assessment tasks to promote learning as opposed to measure how much they have learned. And this is really, really important because it becomes the core, uh, the, the, it, it becomes part of the learning experience besides hearing you and you helping to align the understanding, the assessment will drive the learning itself. So typically, assignments, projects, and others are viewed from the perspective of assessment artifacts as evidence of learning. Generally, tasks are crafted for learners to demonstrate what they have learned. This initiative demands a paradigm shift. So that's very important. You need to view assessment differently in order to support the learning experience. As, okay, task must be designed to complement the academic's work. 
The task must be designed to promote learning and inquiry with the intention to promote independent learning because that's the goal. The goal of this whole Teach Less Learn More is to produce learners who can learn in, a, in their entire life, lifelong learning. And in most part, they have the degree of independence to coordinate learning. So independent learning is not about learning about you on your own. It's about you having responsibility of learning, either deciding to collaborate, deciding to independent, inside to, to, to bring in a whole bunch of other learners in. So this, this independence that what Teach Less Learn More would like to uh, deliver. So this is it. The end of the day, if students don't learn to learn, we have failed to teach. Now, before I conclude, the idea here is this. Teach Less Learn More is not a quantitative experience. It's a qualitative experience. It's, it's tend to uh, optimize your resources to where people need you the most. So it's not about jumbling a bunch of ideas and throwing it in your heads. It's spending the right amount of the time in the right place, in the right activity to make sure the learning is coordinated, organized, and meaningful.